On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you today, Tim? I am doing great. And in this episode, which we recorded live last Thursday evening on Get Vocal, which we do regularly at live shows on Thursday night on Get Vocal, this one we recorded with Jason Watts and Jennifer Amell. Jason Watts is an advocate for Brandon Lawson's case, and he was recently visiting New England, and we took a trip to Vermont with him. He really wanted to go see where Brianna Maitland went missing, so we ventured up there with him, with Jennifer Amell as well, who works with us. It was pretty interesting, and we talked about the trip in this episode. Yeah, we highlighted the feelings that we all had while we were at the location where the old Dutch burn house used to stand. It's nothing more than what would be maybe a little bit of foundation from the house it burned down years ago and was, you know, essentially just leveled. And then we made our way over to the Black Lantern Inn where Brianna worked a few shifts before her disappearance some unexpected emotions, and overall just a really productive day. And of course, Brianna Maitland went missing in Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th, 2004. She was 17 years old at the time. And of course, we work with Bruce Maitland, her father, on his nonprofit, Private Investigations for the Missing. So you can check them out and us out at investigationsforthemissing.org. Also, all their social channels are really great, and there are links in the show notes to follow those. Private investigator Greg Overacker joins us a little bit later on the show, and we're going to play some clips from our trip to Montgomery as well. And be sure to swing on over to our website, crawlspace-media.com, to learn more about new shows, old shows with new episodes, any live events coming up, anything you could ask for. Head on over there, crawlspace-media.com. I've followed Brianna's case for a long time. I think I can remember reading about it in like 2006, 2007. I really got knee deep in missing person cases when Brandon went missing, but I had never forgot about Brianna's case and, and Maura's case and stuff like that. And one of the things I've always tried to do is inspire and, and motivate people to do the same. And I wanted to be one of those guys that did more than just talk about it. I, you know, I, like I started using the hashtag bring it for Brie when I would talk about Brianna's case. And I was like, well, how do I motivate and inspire people to do that if, if I don't at least try to do it myself? And so when the opportunity to come up there and, and see you guys came about, you know, I came up there to visit you guys to record an episode on Brandon, but I knew being up in that area, the potential to go to those places was there. And I, I think, you know, we all kind of started talking and said, yeah, you know, we should, we should definitely try to do that. And so, you know, that was, that was, that was on the list of, of things I wanted to accomplish being there. And so being able to do that, you know, I felt like I was putting my words into action. 
Well, I would say you did that. Um, pretty drastic measures of, uh, of traveling uh, nearly across the uh, country to, uh, to come up here. And, and what did you learn, I guess? What, uh, w- any, any major takeaways? It's kind of like a lot of missing persons cases. You don't have enough evidence to say for sure. Uh, all you can really do is, is try to reasonably speculate. And Brianna's case was no different. Um, I think Brianna's case was probably the fourth or fifth disappearance that I actually visited the scene. And, you know, you'll hear people talk about visiting scenes of missing persons cases where, you know, they get this creeped out feeling of being there or it makes them feel uneasy to be in that spot. I had never encountered that feeling, you know, being at the scene of Brandon's disappearance or, or being at the scene of Jason Landry's disappearance. Uh, I, you know, I, I know I'm in a spot where a human being was last known to be, and I'm certainly you know aware of that. And so I was really curious to see how being where Brianna was would make me feel. And I ended up being emotionally affected a little bit more than I thought I would. I mean, I think you guys remember when we got back in the car after being at the site for a little while, I was a little emotionally off. I, I remember telling you guys, it, it's not fucking fair what happened to her. Uh, hey, hold up. Isn't, isn't this coming it coming up? Is it? This is it. Yeah. Wow. You recognize the two ropes? Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. there's what's left of the foundation. I mean, it's so different. Yeah. It's crazy. Here. Why? Why stop? I'm wondering if someone passed her on this corner and slammed on the brakes. She would have had two options rear end them or come off into here, right? And then she throws it in reverse. Why? She's coming from the Black Lantern, right? This is speculation, but like if someone's following her and they want her to stop, where's the best place to pass somebody? Around a curve, right? Gas on it, go around, slam on the brakes. She's got one option, or two options. She rear ends the shit out of them, or she has to go around and ends up over here, right? Then she throws it in reverse to get the hell out, wham, right into the house. They get out, run up, whatever happens, happens. They pull her out, they're gone. The reason it looks like it happens so quick is because it does. And those uh, emotions you you weren't really expecting, and it sort of generated at the scene of the Dutch Burn Foundation, which isn't even really a foundation anymore. Um, it's some remnants of a foundation. The house is no longer there. Yeah, what is what was it that happened there? What did you expect it, and and when did it kind of set in? I didn't expect it. I wasn't expecting it. Like I said, I've, I've been to the scene of other disappearances and, you know, not really being emotionally affected like that. Michelle Kez said this best once when she was talking to you guys. Each of us wants to see something of ourselves and the person we're looking for. I think we can all relate to Brianna. We've all been that 17 year old kid that's trying to find their place in the world and, and, and sometimes struggling to, to find that path. And so she's very relatable to a lot of us. And I think that was, I was feeling that as I was being in that spot, reaching out and, and touching what was left of the foundation of the Dutch burn house elicited those emotions a little bit. You know, we've all struggled to find our, our place at 17 and, and by all accounts, Brianna was struggling a little bit to find her place and she had kind of a rough patch there at the end. And, you know, she hurt some of her friends feelings. We we've all done that. And the best, you know, any of us could hope for was was ask for forgiveness and, and try to make it right. And one of the things that I found really, really sad was Brianna didn't get the chance to make it right with those people. And I'm sure she would have. There's some sadness to that. And Jennifer, what did you think? Now you're uh, you're 
well, I don't want to call you, call you a local um, at this point, but um, <laughs> uh, what, what did you think? In, in I know this is actually the second time you had been up to um, to Montgomery to uh, the site where she was last seen and um, the Dutch burn spot. Can you tell us uh, your thoughts on on that area? I had been up there uh, a few weeks previous with uh, Lou and Greg um, on a mission to talk to some people who might have been might have had some information on Brianna and that trip was uh, I wouldn't call it emotional because like we went there kind of in a mindset not to reflect but to like take action if that makes any sense so I didn't really allow myself any any time to like feel anything I did expect to feel something and at the Dutch burn nothing really came to me but weirdly when we were passing by a farmstead um, I think Lou and Greg had said, you know, there was some kind of rumor that she might have gone to a party there or something. I did feel this, like, kind of guttural drop in my stomach, and I don't know what that was about. That was completely unexpected. I don't know how much stock to to place in that kind of response. Have you guys ever experienced that? Well, we yeah, we had this conversation, too, um, a bit with Jason and, and you in the car, and... Uh, I no, <laughs> I I I I don't. Physical locations like that, geographical locations like that, don't really elicit that type of response from me. Um, and I, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you because of talking with uh people like Greg Overacker, who and and even Lou, and uh, when when we hear how they approach an investigation, um, it's not. I mean, they obviously feel emotional about it. They, they obviously care. They wouldn't do it if they didn't care, but they care about details and facts. And if you're at the scene, you're there looking at details and facts and you're sort of separating yourself from, from you know, emotionally. And I'm not saying that it's right or wrong to feel emotional there. I, I think it is absolutely right. But um, just like talking about it, uh, I, I like when... When Brandon's parents came on with you, Jason, several months ago, that's the emotional part for me. Like, I can't watch a dad talk about his his missing or or his son or when Bruce comes on like that. That just does it for me. Uh, being at a location, I think I don't want anything in my head making it any more difficult than it already is. You know, I was not expecting that to, to happen just did. I mean, and I remember when we were in the parking lot of the Black Lantern. I can't, I don't know how to explain it, but I, I kept feeling this pull to go back. And I didn't understand that. I don't understand what that pull was to go back. What happened back there was kind of hard to explain, I guess. When I said it hit me emotionally, I did the same thing back there that I do a lot of times when I'm at where Brandon went missing. I stopped and like took, took it in. And when I leave the site where Brandon went missing, I always walk back out and I put my hand on the hard hat that's on the cross and I tell Brandon, I'll be back. I'll be back for you. And I. I can't explain it, man, but it's like this, I, I almost get the same want to do that back there, go back out there and say, I'll be back. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. Something that we did there that was really interesting was when we went back, like you said, um, you felt this pull to go back. We we ended up like driving the car. So we're going from the Black Lantern to the uh, Dutch Burn and we drove the car same way that Brianna would have driven. And and it's hard to explain how you think the car went into the back of the building when you see the picture for the first time or for the 50th time and you explain it and you look at the tires and you say well this is how it could have it could have happened but we we kind of talked it out as we were driving and that made me feel something like thinking about why why she would have pulled in the way she did backed up because that's what we did we pulled in crossed the lane pulled in backed up so that our car would have been pretty much where hers was. And then we realized like why she would have done that. 
and and that you know it's pretty uh, it's a pretty interesting moment. Well, when you're when you're trying to figure out what happened, it's just it's natural to speculate. You know, I've, I've speculated a lot when I've gone to Brand the site of Brandon's disappearance. You know, you try you try to play the scenario out out in your mind in the most reasonable way based on the information that you have. And you know, one thing I speculated on was that that there's kind of that corner there, and I I thought maybe somebody you know, use that corner to go around her, get in front of her and slam on the brakes. And then she had two options, rear end them or kind of pull off into that grade. Whoever that other person was either got out of the car or, or tried to pull nose to nose in front of her. And she, you know, panicked and threw it in reverse and it's pitch black. So you're not going to see that house there. And boom. I mean, that's, that's again, a speculation, but you're, you're, you're trying to, to fit the puzzle pieces together reasonably. I mean, that's all you can do. Yeah, and the area seemed a little bit more populated than I actually would have expected, I think. Um, one, one pretty immediate thought I had in uh, going through Montgomery, I always imagined it to be more desolate. Um, there was a little center of town. There were people. Um, there was even a farm across the street from where the Dutch burn, um, sat and, and it doesn't sit there anymore. It was, uh, taken down the house. And this is, uh, of course, if you Google Brianna Maitland, definitely one of the first pictures you'll see besides pictures of her is, um, a picture of her car backed into this, uh, old house called the Dutch burn house that is not there anymore. But Brianna's car was actually held up on the foundation of that house. And uh, I don't believe it could have been moved, um, driven, actually, really, out at that point without maybe a push or something. It's kind of hard to say for for us, but it's kind of what it sounded like. I was struck by how close the Dutchburn and the Black Lantern actually were. It took us probably, what, two minutes to get between the two, if that, yeah. Yeah, I was blown away by how close it was too, because Brandon's. He, I mean, he, he his truck was found four miles from Bront, and I mean, you still you get there like that when you're traveling at 60, 70 miles an hour. But when when we left the Black Lantern and went back to the side of the Duxbury, and I was like, man, and I thought Brandon's was close. This is this is crazy that she didn't even get a minute and a half, two minutes down the road. Yeah, I mean, granted, Lance was driving like what, like a buck twenty, I think, down there. Hell yeah! I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was taking it easy. I was going one ten. You're putting my rental car to the test, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> it was a rental car, of course. We're gonna beat the thing, and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. The other thing that was interesting to me, uh, at least when I went with uh, Lou and Greg, that they had pointed out where Brianna was staying with her friend, like in the, so she was heading in the direction from work, the Black Lantern, and heading in the direction that she would go to go home. So it's not like she went the opposite way home and had intended to go elsewhere. She was traveling heading along home. her expected route. Right, right, exactly. I thought there was like maybe some turn around or like I, I wasn't sure exactly what her route would have been like after work but that seems most likely that she would have just you know been tired and wanted to go get rest because she was working quite early the next day she had a second job that she was just starting right yeah thinking about the whole thing with the lime wedge too when we were uh, at the in the parking lot of the black lantern I don't know if you guys thought about that either but I noticed where we parked was right by the dumpster. And I, and I know Greg has, has talked about this before when he's been on with you guys where, you know, you, you chuck the trash bag into the dumpster and maybe the line falls out that way. And, and that's, you know, reasonable speculation. But one thing, uh, one thing I got to thinking about is, you know, there's that the dumpster is in that fenced off kind of, I guess, gate and a lot of restaurants have those around their dumpsters to keep like wild dogs and stuff out. But when we were parked there, we were parked right next to that. And one thing that kind of got me thinking is, you know, somebody has to open that gate to open the dumpster and throw the trash in. Right. Well, could somebody have set the trash bag on the trunk of the car? And while they were opening that gate, and I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I don't pack the 
trash down as great as I could. And I'll set it on a flat surface and it'll tip over. And then if you got one of those trash bags with the drawstrings, they don't cinch up all the way and stuff will roll out of it when the trash bag falls over. So, you know, could somebody have set that on the trunk of Rihanna's car while they were opening that gate? It falls over. The lime wedge rolls out of the trash bag. Bada beam, bada boom. There you go. You get a lime wedge on the trunk. And that's speculation. Yeah, I don't know. The The parking lot was pretty small. I mean, probably room for like 10 spots, maybe 15 spots at the most. Um, I will say about the distance between the Black Lantern Inn and the Dutch Burner, where the Dutch Burn used to be, um, is it was so short that it made you think that she she had to have been followed in some way. Um, she it, it had to have been um, whoever I would imagine took her, abducted her, um, knew when she was leaving or, or followed her from a spot where they were watching. I noticed there was like, was that a church that was like across the street from the Black Lantern? And then there was a couple of other buildings, I think. You know, I, I wondered, was somebody sitting over there in one of those parking lots? But it's, it's like Lou and Greg have pointed out, they would either had to have known she was getting ready to leave or been really patient enough to wait for. Mm -hmm. And if she was followed from the Black Lantern, I mean, they easily could have overtaken her car on that curve so like when you're heading toward the dutch burn there is like not a sharp curve but kind of like a i guess you would call it a gentle curve of the road and the dutch burn sits on this side so if she was making that turn you could easily see that if like if somebody sped up around her and cut her off and that's what caused her to stop and like oh go oh fuck and back up because her Wheels already cocked, right? So she throws it in reverse right back into the to the Dutch burn. I think I said it while we were there. If I was going to pass somebody, I'd use that curve to my advantage. Yeah, yeah. You're totally right. Right. So it kind of loops back around to the left. And then the Dutch burn. So it kind of goes like that. And the Dutch burn's over there. So, yeah, I think you're saying if you are to go into the opposite lane, um, which of course is on the wrong side of the road in the States, in the U.S., um, and just floored it, you probably could have gotten in front of her based on that turn uh, pretty easily. It would have taken guts because if somebody else come around oncoming, head-on collision. But, I mean, it's, hey. it was, what, 11, 20 at night? I mean, I don't know how well that road has traveled at night. I don't even remember. There were a few cars that passed us while we were sitting there at the site, I think. Yeah, I would, I would have to say there were more cars uh, than expected. And uh, and I do have to say that uh, James Robitelli um, died in a car accident um, in a very similar way to that. And I'm not, not saying he's the, he abducted Brianna, but I'm just saying maybe that's a way of life up there, sort of getting into that lane and flooring it and trying to get around the person who might be going a little slower than you want. And, uh, I mean, that is basically exactly what happened Uh to Brianna's ex um, boyfriend, just a couple of years ago, he um, he died trying to pass a car in a road in Vermont. Yeah, you actually see that quite a bit down here in Texas. People will pass people going uphill or going around corners. It's just it can be dangerous. Yeah, no no passing zones. Just obey the obey the signs. Obey the rules. Just obey the rules. <laughs> um, and it's also interesting when you're at the uh, Dutchburn location that it doesn't look like the pictures obviously because the house isn't there but there's now just rows and rows and rows of corn and in the pictures there's it's just sort of barren and um you can see the tree line and and you can you know see you know pretty far when you're looking at the old pictures but somewhere along the lines they just planted a bunch of corn there it's probably from the the uh the farm that's across the street as well um so I can see now, like, just driving right by it, not even knowing, you know, that something like that happened there. Lance, if I recall correctly, you and I got to looking. Didn't we see that, like, a, some sort of, I, I want to say it was like a farming company or something like that owns that property now? Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, it's like an agricultural company. I didn't memorize the name of the company, but I, I thought I remember it being along those lines of, yeah, there was a lot of corn there um, behind where the Dutch burn used to sit. Really a huge cornfield now. Um, and then across the street as well. Owners of that farm seemed nice. They drove by a few times. Didn't I don't know. I don't want I don't know if we waved or anything. We kind of probably nodded a little bit, but um 
Yeah, I mean, everyone seemed friendly, you know, and, and that's the only thing I would say about um, the locations. Uh, and I don't know, this might only be the second second location of a missing person that I have ever visited, but um, Moore Murray site is very different um, in, in in that way and really probably just because of the ways just described Brianna's site, more cars than you'd expect, which is similar actually to Mora's. Um, but I think it's just the eyeballs on you. It's just kind of at Mora's site, you know, there are houses there. You're kind of blocking the road if you're even parked on the road there. Um, it's not really the safest place to stop. So you kind of feel those eyeballs on you. It's not so much of an eerie feeling, um, probably because of what happened there, but more so much a feeling of people watching you. Didn't get that feeling at all at uh, Brianna Maitland's site. No, and you don't get that feeling when you're at Brandon's either. I mean, you, they're, they're now, one thing I will say about Brandon's is a lot of cars pass you by because you're on a busy highway. Uh, but most of the time, if I'm, if I'm down there, uh, you know, it's kind of like when we were at Brianna's, you know, people will nod, you know, they'll wave. Uh, but Brandon's is, is, is different from Brianna's. And I didn't get the chance to go by Morris, but you have a big old 40 foot wide spot of grass that you can pull off into at Brandon's. So, I mean, you're not, you're not right there next to the road or anything like that. Nobody's going to, you know, come around the corner and accidentally smack you or anything like that. Right. And we um, went to the Black Lantern and uh, you mentioned the parking lot and the parking lot, I guess in my head when I was picturing all of this, I, I just I knew from going on, uh, you know, Google and, and checking out the images, uh, I knew what it looked like. But I, but, but my, my brain always kept going to a restaurant that I worked at in New Hampshire. Every time we talked about it, that's just where my my head always went was the parking lot in this restaurant that I worked at in New Hampshire. And it was so great to finally like be at that location. Now I can actually have that accurate memory of what that parking lot looked like and see where the back door of the restaurant is where that's located and know that that's probably where the employees go out and they get, you know, they, they get in their car after their shift or they go in for their beginning of the shift. And that's probably where Brianna left was through that back door. And we were there for probably like 10 minutes or so. No longer. We we're probably there for like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes before. Um, and they were closed uh, before somebody came out. And uh, that was really interesting. And Jen had the I, I think I, I kind of froze. I was just like, I don't know what to tell this person. It was this woman with a bucket and she was obviously doing some gardening, but uh, Jen approached her. I did. That's my toss to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Um, yeah. Tim and I were filming, which I mean, some people are a little suspicious when they see people filming, especially if a business is closed and she happened to work for the Black Lantern, and when I when I uh, went up and apologized, like you know, sorry that we're kind of not trespassing, but it's it's a bit of an odd thing to do, you know, and uh, said we were you know uh, part of Crawl Space and looking into Brianna Maitland's disappearance, and did she know anything about it? And it turns out that she worked with Brianna, which was pretty cool to find out, and. God, she said she'd been there for like 20 years. Is that right? Yeah, at least 17, 18 years. Um, yeah, w what a what a sort of a coincidence to just, um, you know, meet someone who had who had known Brie. And, and Brianna only worked at the Black Lantern for, I think, two shifts. So that was all that she really knew of Brianna, where it was working with her during those two shifts um, at the Black Lantern. But um, she did sort of tell us that, she could tell um, as someone who was older than Brie at the time, not much older, probably uh, maybe only five years or something, but that she was going through some stuff. Uh, and she had mentioned that she saw Brie's uh, black eyes, her two black eyes. And um, this woman asked Brianna what happened. And Brianna told her the story of what happened um, during that fight with Keely. And uh, I thought that was really interesting to hear, hear that recounted, um, back from someone who spoke who you know it's it's sort of like hearing it right from brianna in in a way you know because i don't know how much media this woman has consumed it doesn't seem like much um and and the story has probably changed over the years but she basically tried to recount exactly what brianna told her yeah i mean the other thing that she said that was interesting to me like she mentioned that she was a bit older than brie but that she had this like kind of 
she was like super protective of Brianna. I remember her saying that like she saw this young girl who she knew who was going through a hard time and she was young and she was pretty and it's not easy being a young woman working in a restaurant because you get harassed all the day and night long by everyone. So I think that she, I think she mentioned that there was a couple like quote unquote creepy patrons. And I don't know if this is anything outside of what is unfortunately normal, like for people to, you know, make passing comments or whatever to Brie. But she, she said she was just like, you know, just protective and a little worried about Brie. Yeah, she did say she was a little protective, kind of felt, um, you know, that, that connection because she was a little older than her and um, almost taking her under her wing a little bit was sort of the vibe. Um, she did say that Brie was a dishwasher, which we knew. Um, she said she did have interaction with patrons as a busser. That was one question we asked. I'm reading the notes right from um, th- that I wrote down right after the conversation. Um, I don't I don't have anything in here about uh, her saying anything about any creepy patrons. I don't think it was specific. It was just no. kind of like a general thing. Yeah, she had said... Um... Because that she had just, uh, I don't know how long it had been, but she had just given birth because she said her daughter was 17. So she said, so it was right around um, the time that she had just given birth or she was pregnant at the time. But she, I remember her saying uh, that she started feeling these motherly sort of protective instincts whenever she would see people like look at Brianna in a, in a, you know, kind of in a sideways way. What are the odds of that, though? Like, what are the odds that somebody worked with her that close to her disappearance and still worked at the Black Lantern? And on the on on the day that they're closed, like technically her day off, she's there doing gardening. You guys were talking about the Dutchburn home. You know that that upsets me that that's gone. That was a landmark. I mean, it, it's kind of a sign for us that time has passed. A great amount of time has passed. But that's upsetting. You know, I was really pissed off when I heard about that. Yeah, it's hard to visualize the space looking at the picture of the car there without, you know, the structure. I mean, you can sort of see a bit of the foundation and stuff, but it's hard to piece together what exactly the moves were without the building being there. When we had went up, um, I hadn't been up there in a long time, a long time. And uh, it just felt totally different to be there without the, the home there and stuff. And you're right. It's it, it's just different. You know, I, I was telling those guys when I was there to tell you how bad time can play uh, tricks on your mind. My memory was that it was farther back off the road quite a bit. You know, I, I looked at pictures prior to going up there and stuff and realized it wasn't. But I had remembered it completely differently because I hadn't been up there in a long, long time. There was no reason to go back there, or I, w- I would have gone back there. But if we knew what happened in that spot, that's it. Game over. We just don't. Yeah, it's a whole pivotal thing. I get. I, I would say I get emotional when I get there, but it bothers me. It aggravates me. You know what I mean? Why did the house come down? I know that there was a fire, and we've said that before, but... <sighs> Yeah, what was it? Was just the the fire was too much. Yeah, kids burned it down. It was it was a shell of a house. You know, it was old, old farmhouse. But you know, you read that article about the Dutch Burn brothers there that lived there. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, whole th- saga with the violence that happened there and everything. And um, I don't. know. The whole thing is just odd to me. You know, this whole thing for me is you know I don't I don't believe in anything to do with. I believe in coincidence. I don't believe in karma. I don't believe in that there's anyone in the universe that's guiding the universe in any way, shape, or form or anything to do with that. But for me, it was re- there's a really odd set of circumstances that happen that lead me to meet Bruce and be a part of this. And then on top of that, it's really bizarro that I'm down here and I'm working, uh, you know, for the nonprofit and we start working on Erica's case and it leads us right back to Brianna, literally to the fact that what is what, are the, what the hell are the chances that I would do that, get involved in this case of this woman that went missing in 1986 and it would lead me back to a man whose son dated Brianna's best friend. 
it's just bizarro, you know. It's super bizarre. You know, it is a small area up there. And when Lou and I went out and met with Jen and stuff, it's so small that we bumped into Richard. We saw Richard um, and Joe's family. Not on purpose, necessarily. You know, we went to talk to this person. And it's right there. I mean, they're right there next to the Fran Licks. And it was just weird that that would happen. I mean, I could have walked to their house. Um, and I said to the person that I was speaking to, I said, oh, by the way, do you know your neighbor? And he's like, no, I don't know that person. I'm like, really? It was, you could see the house. Wait a second. Sorry. I, I just want to back this up a little bit now. Um, you were talking about Erica Franelich's disappearance um, that we've covered on the show. Um, please go back and check out those episodes. Uh, and when you were up there doing work for Brianna, you ran into Erica's ex-husband or husband at the time of her disappearance? Yeah, we didn't speak to him. We saw him. Yeah, it's a small area, you know. No, did you lock eyes with him at all? Hmm. From a distance. Did you want to follow him? You know, we made a decision not to speak with him because we know what the we know what the results are going to be. There's a, in that case, there's a frustration with the police, and at some point, I'm just going to come out publicly and talk about it because I'm I'm pissed off. My my soul and my psyche is so damaged from it. I I just but we knew that if we went and talked to Richard, he's just going to sink it out of here, you know. He's not going to talk to us. But it was so strange that we would go to do something for Brianna and at one point be within walking distance of someone that was involved in the Franlick case. 